Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Good evening, and welcome to the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C.'s author series program with John Zogby. My name's Heidi Shoup. I'm president of the World Affairs Council, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. Tonight, it's our great pleasure to welcome John Zogby, the founder of Zogby Analytics and author of The First Globals. John, it's so nice to have you with us here tonight, and I look forward to your comments. He will be introduced by Tony Cully Foster, who, in addition to being the Global Communications Committee Chair of the World Affairs Council Board of Directors, is founder and president of CFCO International, an international business consultancy specializing in business management, government relations, corporate communications, and support services to the senior management of European and Asian companies seeking to enter the American market. One of the issues all businesses and nonprofits and governments, for that matter, are trying to grapple with today are the changes that are being and will be brought about by the first globals. So please join me in welcoming Tony Cully Foster, who will introduce tonight's speaker. I'm uh, very privileged tonight to welcome a friend to this podium, a friend uh, on a personal basis a friend on a professional basis, and a great champion of proving to the world that knowledge is power, the use of knowledge being power. John, ba John Zogby is a Lebanese Catholic. Now, that's a kind of an interesting combination to start life off with. Kept them on the move. And uh, I think that's where his interest in polling really began. <laughs> to see the pros and cons of what both of those strengths that his parents shared with him uh, could do for him in terms of the career that he sought. John, that was my reading last night. This is fantastic. This is the how-to. This is taking your book, your life philosophy, your professional ethos, and giving a very practical guide to us older people who need a lot of help about understanding the first globals, some of whom are here in your audience tonight. Okay, So welcome to the World Affairs Council. You're a frequent and valued guest and supporter of ours. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor John Zogby. Every so often a book comes around that you absolutely, positively have to read. Mine is not that book. I just want you to buy my book. <laughs> my next book is the blockbuster. Let me tell you how I came about this book. In 2002, I was commissioned to do a series of polls for the Foreign Policy Association in New York. And we were to take a close look at American attitudes and behaviors regarding uh, American attitudes towards uh, a whole list of countries, policies towards some countries and regions, major burning issues from global warming to the United Nations and our involvement in the United Nations, to the World Court, to the Kyoto Protocols, to a look, broadly speaking, at America's role in the world. And were we the policemen of the world, or in the words of Fareed Zakaria, cognizant of the rise of the rest and just perhaps a first among other major powers. To multiculturalism, 
to just, you get the picture, a wide variety, about 120 to 140 questions over the course of three surveys. And so, you know, we crunch those numbers and take a look at the nationwide averages. A lot of, of those issues predictably were split down the middle. That's pretty much the story of this nation. Just as many support as oppose, agree as disagree, or whatever. But the thing that was particularly striking to me is that when I looked at the age groups, 18 to 29 year olds, 30 to 49, 50 to 64, 65 plus, I saw three age groups, those in their 30s and older, and their sentiments pretty well clustered together, give or take five, six, ten points. But the 18 to 29 year olds were different and in many cases dramatically different in their worldview and their understanding of the role of the United States in the world and their feeling about how the U.S. should become involved or not involved in certain issues, their attitudes towards war, et cetera, dramatically different. So these were three surveys. Three surveys, not yet a trend, but made you look, you know? And so I determined that what I needed to do was follow my polling and follow it by age cohorts. And so it's been over a decade now and it's a wide variety of issues and behaviors and values that we've tested. And clearly what I came away with was the sense that millennials, those born thus far between 1979 and 1994, are in fact America's first global citizens or shortened first globals. And so I'm going to kind of use a PowerPoint, but listen to me, and I'll tell you when to watch, okay? What I've done in the first part of the book, first eight chapters, is descriptive. For globals and their multicultural world, globals and the changing workplace. Globals in a better world, the devotion to international philanthropy. Chapter four, globals and horizontal problem solving. More about these as we go along. Globals and mobility, being constantly on the move. Globals and citizenship, globals and independence, the impact of first global women. But in writing this, I decided to team up with a woman, a young woman, who herself, Joan Snyder Cool, is a, a millennial, first global management consultant. She works both with managers and marketers and communicators on one side, and then with globals themselves in terms of placing them in this world. And then the rest of the book then is management strategies and solutions, a practical how-to. So now you're going to see some tables through the course of my presentation. And the tables are going to show you how different, in many instances, first globals are from other age cohorts. Let's get a look at those, those age cohorts as I see them. And so our first group I call the privates, born between 1926 and 1945. They're the John McCain generation that in many ways they're devoted to traditional values, duty, honor, patriotism, family. And at the same time with those traditional values, they have also provided the leadership of some of the great movements in our recent history, such as the Civil Rights Movement 
and one that you're going to be hearing an awful lot about, certainly that I'm going to be hearing an awful lot about. We don't call it retirement anymore. Don't chuckle. We call it encore living. And this group is pioneering an encore living for reasons that we'll see in a second. Principally, I love this term in bold, vol work, which means I have 10, 15 years of solid living ahead of me. I'm going to live it, and I'm going to work the way I want to, at what I want to, unfettered. Vol work doesn't necessarily mean not being paid. It means having the power to choose how you're going to work. Second group, me. Woodstockers, I call us. Baby boomers, born between 1946 and 64. There's 78 million baby boomers or Woodstockers. We're the largest age cohort. And a lot was made of us. As infants, the post-war baby boom. Entering kindergarten, we changed fashion. We changed then adolescence. We did such a good job at defining adolescence that now that we're in our 50s and 60s, we're having a very difficult time leaving that adolescence. Incidentally, the term is intensely personal because I went to Woodstock. And my wife was so kind to tell our three sons that dad was at Woodstock. That was the day that I lost all moral authority in my home. <laughs> On one hand, because so much has been made of us, we're known for our self-indulgence. On the other hand, there are values for a kinder and gentler world that we not only have brought with us into adulthood, but have imparted on our children, the boomer babies. And the boomer babies is just another name for first globals. Third group, <clears throat> Generation X to others, I call this group Nikes. Why? Because they were born into an America that was falling apart. Now think about it. In their youth, in their coming of age, they were born into America of high-profile assassinations. The Kennedys and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X of race riots, the worst race riots in American history. Vietnam, the loss of America's, the, America's first loss of a war. Commodities shortages, a message 1973, whether it was oil or sugar or coffee, that the United States of America did not control global markets. Roe v. Wade, regardless of one's position on abortion, that's not the relevant point. The relevant point was that for the first time in American history, there were children being born who were hearing, she wasn't planned. We, you know, we really didn't want him. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but that can kind of have an impact on a kid, you know. Um, a boomlet in divorces. When we boomers were kids, everybody had a mom and dad at home. To the Nikes, for the first time in the 1970s, one-third of marriages ending in divorces and growing. So why Nikes? They were on their own. Just do it. And now, our globals. Now, 1979 and 1994, so far, this group is still growing. Let me just explain to you first, what makes an age cohort? There are age groups. And age groups are part of the life cycle. So I'll suggest to you 20-somethings are always 20-somethings. I'm concerned with myself, how I look, my relationship, what should I wear, my career, 
myself. Different from 30-somethings, 40-somethings, and, and so on. What makes an age cohort, however, is how history intrudes upon an age group and defines the uniqueness of that age group. So an example, I mentioned this in my book. I recall a favorite economics professor, undergrad, telling me how he and his friends when they were in college were sitting at the dorm a weekend in early December of 1941 talking about what college boys talk about. Girls, sports, sports and girls, girls and sports. And then Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941, history intruded, and how he and his dorm mates and roommates had to wait in line at the selective service Monday morning to register for the draft. They became the greatest generation. They weren't born to be the greatest generation. They became it. So our first globals, first of all, in terms of size, today are 72 million. As we'll see, history has intruded upon their lives twice. And until there is another major event, positive or a cataclysmic event, to define a new group, I see First Globals growing into those born 1995 and 96 and 97, at least so far, which means that they're important as well by their sheer size. They're the second largest age cohort now. They could tie or surpass the sheer numbers of boomers. So how has history intruded in their lives? The first, obviously, is 9-11. Anywhere from middle school to those in high school and even in college or of college age at that time. The interesting thing about 9-11, two different invasions, Pearl Harbor made the greatest generation turn inward to protect and defend the United States of America and the values for which it stands. 9-11 turned what was already a global generation into a more global generation, made them turn outward. Who are these people? Why do they do the things that they do? I need to find out more and more about them. Now, the Globals already had a head start through the 1990s. They were steeped in mobile technology. They were also nurtured via global fashion, United Colors of Benetton, Tommy Hilfiger, Louis Vuitton. They wore and sought global brands. Global music, they listened to musicians not only from all over the world, but through hip hop and other genres. They saw the blending and mixing of other forms of global and national music into American music. Global sports, America's first globals were the first group to play more soccer than baseball or football. And in all of those instances, there was already a global mentality. When 9-11 hit, how do we go to war against people who look like us, who dress like us? Who are they? 9-11 was the first major cataclysmic event. The second is the Great Recession, starting in 2007. 
Now, I've had some critics, I know that's hard to believe, but I've had some critics who have suggested, yeah, but we had a depression and people bucked up and they survived and they eventually thrived. It was good for them. And I've had others say, well, a recession here, a recession there, this is the boom and bust of the economic cycle. What makes this so powerful, though, is when you stop and think that this recession began in 2007, it is now 2013, and to many first globals, this recession is the, has been their entire adult life, which of course has a tremendous impact on their thinking, as we'll see. So let's look at globals and their multicultural world. How likely is it that you will live and work in a capital of a foreign country during your lifetime? The first global's age cohort, 35% say that it is likely. That declines down to the Nikes, 12 points. The Woodstockers, 12. The Privates, because of the point at which they are in the life cycle, down to 2%. Now understand, just prior to the global recession, the national recession, that number had reached 40% among first globals. And so, for reasons I'll mention in a moment, dissipated a little, but still significantly higher. One thing I should note that I don't have a table on in the PowerPoint is that first global 67% have active passports and have traveled abroad. That is higher than any other age cohort. First globals in their multicultural world. Is American cu culture inherently superior to the culture of? And there we have our list. China, Southeast Asia, the rest of Asia, Africa, Arab, Europe. What you'll note here is that in no instance does it hit 50% among first globals. Now, some of you may be discouraged that the numbers are as high as they are, but the fact of the matter is now, just compare them with the Nikes, who to some degree have experienced globalism, but then to Woodstockers and privates. In fact, look at the contrast between privates, the World War II, and m more uh, accurately, the Cold War generation, 58% American culture is superior to China. That's 17 points higher. 72% of Southeast Asia, 65, 70, well, you see the picture. Even 52% who say inherently superior to the culture of Europe. How important is speaking a foreign language fluently to you? And frankly, the question goes on a little bit. Speaking a foreign language in order to conduct business for your future and career. First globals vary or somewhat important 60% dramatically higher than Nikes, Woodstockers, or privates. Those who just say very important, one-third. And again, that's almost twice as much as Nikes and dramatically higher than Woodstockers and privates. Okay, globals in the changing workplace. One of the things that you hear, and, and this sort of bothers me, this is the reason why I came out with the book, because there's so much being written about millennials, and my fear is that a lot of it is based on millennials as 20-somethings and not as first globals, this age cohort. And so, sure, older folks have always complained about younger folks 
in the workplace. This older folk, I'm on the road two-thirds of the year. I was running a business until just about a year ago, and I would run into the office, and I would see, forgive me, kids, but I'm going to call you kids, my employees and interns with a mobile device in their left hand and a mouse in their right hand, and I would call somebody aside and say, why are they doing that? They're, why are they wasting time? And I would be told invariably, they're marketing Zogby all over the world. Oh, well, what do I know? Why is she on eBay at 2 o'clock in the afternoon? She's saving you money on hardware. All right, so I just go into my little cubicle, my cave, I used to call my office, shut the door and say, they know better about what's going on, just shut up. And they do. Are they slackers? No. They live in a 24-7 world. I've seen the revolution. And young people are accustomed to being in touch, whether it's just friendly social media or working with the rest of the world. So they're on, in other words. Can't be measured by nine to five. They are, in fact, in this one way, but there are many, revolutionizing the workplace. The fast track to advancement. I will say that I've seen a sea change in First Globals as a result of the, the Great Recession. It was not that long ago that young people would come into my office with their resumes and they would say, I have options, you know. Can you tell me how I get to be COO of Zogby International in the next three years? <laughs> yeah, one way is to get the hell out of here <laughs> and close the door. The Great Recession has changed that and maybe for them there's a little bit of a silver lining. Remember, better to have your hard times in your 20s than in your 40s. But the other silver lining is now young people do come in and say, please, I need to get started. I need to build my resume. I'm willing to work. Um, if you can pay me, please, I need to pay the rent. There is still the desire for a fast track to advancement, nonetheless. Because what's imbued in First Globals is that they have a message for how to make the world a better place. You're going to see in a second. And so they want to have an impact. In fact, it's a requirement for them. Sure, they're willing to work. And sure, they're on 7 and 24. But at the same time, they also feel more than any other age cohort, as you're going to see, that they want to be a part of change and making the world a better place. And the best way to, for them to be able to do that is to be able to advance or be able to do special things, as we'll see. 85%, much higher than any other age group, seek to advance, achieve useful and beneficial life experience from their work, much higher than any other age cohort. 71% say it's important to do something that changes the world, significantly higher than any other age cohort. How important is it to you to contribute your time and money to an international charity? 62% of First Globals say that it is very or somewhat important compared to the 48% of Nikes, 32% Woodstockers, 24% Privates. I want to weigh in on the contribution here. Because on one hand, there's the fiduciary 
contribution. I had the good fortune about five or six years ago, six years ago actually, to uh, consult on behalf of um, the World Health Organization, UNAIDS. They felt they weren't getting their message out and they weren't getting their message out to potential donors. And essentially, at the meeting, in addition to myself and people from WHO, were representatives of a major, major global public relations company who laid out their formula, which was full page ads about what UNAIDS is doing in the London Times, the New York Times, the Washington Post. What they were doing was the old formula. If you need $25 million, get 35 people to give $25 million. My approach was, let's reverse that. You need an entirely new donor base. You need to get the 25 million donors that give $35. And how do you do that? Well, the, the, the term that I used back then, I did not coin, but the term that I used back then that has now grown in popularity is crowdfunding, essentially. It is what was done in the, during the, the, the Haiti earthquake when close to a billion dollars was raised in four days via Nextel. This is a sea change because you meet with groups of young people and they will tell you, you know what? I like Fort Lauderdale, but I'm not going to Fort Lauderdale. I'm going to Costa Rica. I'm going to spend a couple of weeks in the Cameroons. They want that opportunity via the workplace. They want to be part of making their world a better place. And this is what's so important. And if this is the number one takeaway that you get from my talk, it is that they don't see the other as the other. They see young people all over the world as one of them. In December of 2004, I saw this in a poll that I did in conjunction with Hamilton College in upstate New York. It was a poll then of 18 to 24 year olds. And I asked an open-ended question. Now, this is December 2004. Please make note of that. What will America look like 20 years from now? The number one answer, unaided, open-ended, was Barack Obama. Why? Because he looks just like us. There is a recognition we have, we have begun through this group. You know, when, when you hear stories of we are not in a post-racial America, we still have races. Yes, we do but much less so among first globals. That gives me some hope, gives me a lot of hope. The sheer demographics of it all give me hope. What also gives me hope are the responses to survey questions when I hear that young people in this country are the least likely to want to go to war because how do you make war against people who wear the same clothes I do, follow the same sports I do, and listen to the same music I do? It's pretty cool. Here is why I take a break and just suggest to you, as I get a little carried away, that globals still are a pain in the butt. And I want you to know that. Who paid for this globalism? Okay? Nonetheless, be proud.
it's working. They want a better world, and they're going to produce it. Globals and horizontal problem solving. Something I identified early. That the rest of us are steeped in verticalism. If there's a problem identified, we take it up the chain of command. And then the way it's supposed to work is that by the time it reaches the third stage of the chain of command, it sort of disappears, goes away. That's how you solve problems. You don't have a problem anymore. Globals are steeped in horizontalism and immediacy. There's a problem, you solve it now. How do you solve it? You crowdsource it. Your crowdsourcing goes viral. Somehow, in some way, an answer comes in. And that same process can build consensus over the resolution. These are the things that kind of excite me. Because <clears throat> you know, as well as I know, so many of our familiar institutions have broken down. Not, not bad people. No, not at all. I mean, you go up to Capitol Hill and you'll find very bright and engaging U.S. senators and congressmen and women, really devoted public servants. The problem is the institution, the, the, the great social critic in the 60s and 70s, Ivan Illich. wrote, I think, really eloquently about the watershed moments in the life of every institution or agency. The institution or agency is formed to deal with an issue to resolve a problem. It begins that way until its first watershed when it discovers that it is actually expending as much effort to sustain itself as it is to resolve the problem. It plateaus until it reaches the second watershed. And that's the point where it's expending more energy, at self-sustenance, than it is at resolving problems. And so in many ways, those of us steeped in verticalism, those of us steeped in bureaucracy, and that's not just government, that's NGOs, that's churches. We live in a zero-sum world. Translated, okay, there's a lot of waste. You're expending too much effort keeping your job and your jobs and your office and your institution. Okay, so we cut it. And in the process, we lay off 1,200 people. That's the zero-sum. We've resolved a problem by creating a new problem. Where are those 1,200 people going to work? What is hopeful about horizontal problem solving is moving into an age where there are fewer and fewer permanent bureaucracies, more and more ad hoc relief or ad hoc problem solving. This generation has a limited capacity for tolerating the slow churning approach to resolving problems that impact customers and efficiencies, which will ultimately drive them out the door. In spite of their world, their nation, their city, their schools, the nonprofit organizations all around them, dominated by bureaucratic structures that are slow, cumbersome, and even dysfunctional, there are newer models that exist and can both enable and benefit from the special skills that First Globals bring to the table. I wrote that. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Globals and mobility, really quickly. Alan Blinder, economist at, um, at Princeton. Um, Let's not talk about a jobs economy. 
First Globals are in the midst of the gig economy. Today's 20-somethings will have had four gigs by the age of 30, 10 by the age of 40. What are the implications of that? These are temporary contracts. Implications are for First Globals to be nimble, to be able to have multiple skills and to be mobile in the ability to travel where you need to travel or to draw upon what the specific skill that you need to fulfill the demands of that contract. What's also important about that is the term you're hearing, you never heard education and entrepreneurism used in the same sentence. Now, community colleges, universities, high schools, they can't do enough in terms of training entrepreneurs. Now, entrepreneurs, on one hand, very clearly represent the potential to form new businesses, particularly in the world of, of mobile technologies, but also the right brain kinds of services that always come up, the hand-holding, the nurturing, the training, and so on. But the part of that entrepreneurialism that people often forget is that in a world of gig economy, being an entrepreneur means being able to bounce, to have the kinds of skills and independence that an entrepreneur has to be creative, to find the next gig and to keep the next gig, and to be looking over your shoulder at the gig after that as well. 32% of First Globals plan to stay at their current job three years or less. That's the world they live in. As you look into the future, is your preference to plant roots at a community and settle down, or would you prefer to be mobile in your life? So you see the plant roots and settle down. First Globals, 46% significantly less than Nikes, Woodstockers, and Privates. Those who want to be mobile are 20%, but those who are not sure, and that's a significant number there, are 34%, a recognition that their world is indeed going to be different. Globals in citizenship, you know, we, we grew up hearing young people don't vote. Well, they do vote. About 50% have been voting. Doesn't seem high, but it's higher than 37, 38, and 41%, which is what it used to be. It's high. Remember the sheer numbers of globals as well and the fact that they're growing. Typically, 17% of the total vote in a presidential election They've been 19% of the total vote in 2008 and 2012. Two percentage points is a lot of additional voters. In 2004, John Kerry had a nine-point margin over George W. Bush. In 2008, this is among first globals, 2008, Obama beat John McCain by 36 points. And then in 2012, Mitt Romney by 23 points. This bears some explanation. Are first globals Democrats? No. First globals are not Republicans. First globals don't distrust government, but there's a growing libertarianism among them. And I'm, I'm telling you now, because part of my job is to predict the future, and sometimes I'm right. Um, the debate of the future that will be dominated by this group is not liberal conservative. It is libertarian versus communitarian. Now, communitarian, that could be government, but it also could be the community. In the process, you're going to see 
and this group will usher in not only the new levels of different levels of decision making, different kinds of decision making, but more importantly, um, uh, it, it will it will usher in less dependence on government doing things. But the issue then is how much is the community responsibility. First Global seek direct involvement through volunteerism and calm opinion and authentic sharing of ideas. What strikes me, you may find this heresy, but if you watch cable TV, and I don't, and I don't recommend it because it is injurious to your health, <laughs> but if you do watch it, you don't see 20-somethings coming on yelling and screaming and shouting. That's everybody else. The young people that come on tone things down. Calm opinion and authentic sharing of ideas. This is the great worry that I have. There is a small but growing segment of First Globals that are college educated, not going anywhere. And that's problematic. That's why I wrote the book. Because my fear is we've had lost generations before, but we really can't afford to lose this one. Number one, too large to lose. But number two, they are the pathway, the transition, and then the redefinition of our future. They're the ones that are going to lead the way. And this is, I, I, this is not hyperbole on my end. Essentially, we're at a point where, of breakdown, tipping point. And we need to be finding resolution to the breakdown of so many of our institutions. And here is a whole fresh and different worldview and MO. Globals and independents, how likely, first of all, over 70% of first globals say they want to be married. The thing is, how likely is it that you may live apart from your spouse to meet financial responsibilities? One in four say likely. How likely is it that spouses will live in separate countries? It may not seem like a large number, but 16% is large. And share raising children in two different locations with a spouse or significant other, that's actually 11%, but the others are much lower. This is a theme I'm working on in my consulting with cities and counties and economic development agencies. I always get that question everywhere. How do we retain our young people? And I tell them, don't think of, of home as where people pay their property taxes. For starters, kids are not going to be buying homes. If they have to be mobile, it doesn't make much sense to be firmly rooted. You saw those numbers earlier. Home, and it's been sewn on pillows now for 200 years. Home is where your heart is. How wrong can pillow embroidery be, for God's sakes? If I have a connection to a place, I don't have to be living there. And in order for me to contribute to the well-being of a place, whether it's financially or as a volunteer, I don't have to live there. I don't have to go to a council meeting on Tuesday night or attend a rally on a Wednesday night. It's all so different. We need to capture that sentiment. First Global Women, and of course, um, which author comes closer to your view? We read a paragraph. We did this twice. Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In, you're familiar with the argument. Does everybody know Gabby Reese's argument? Gabby Reese is a professional retired volleyball player and model 
who, and she decided, well, my foot is too big for the glass slipper, she decided that when she and her husband had children, she was going to stay home. Mom needed to be the nurturer. She gave up her career. So which do you agree with? Uh, among first globals, you see um, that uh, uh, it's 39% agree with Sheryl Sandberg and 27% with Gabby Reese. If you look over there, you'll see that Nikes, Woodstockers, and Privates are far different. But part of what you'll see here in the next row is that it's first global women almost exclusively who lean in with Sheryl Sandberg, 51% to 27% for Gabby Reese. The next row down is leads with first global men, which is 27% and 29%. So it is actually young women that are siding with Sheryl Sandberg, which means that we will have a very interesting debate over the next generation, to be sure. And the conclusion is I got tired of millennials being trashed. Too important a generation, and my fear, as I've said, is that um, we could lose them. Hence, the reason why the, uh, there's a revisionist examination based on polling data and demographic data, and why we then go into management strategies, government strategies, NGO strategies, and so on, that will enable this age cohort. Uh, thank you for speaking tonight. It was a pleasure. Um, well, speaking of um, First Global's views of themselves as part of the world, how much of uh, your findings do you think apply to people of the same age cohort but outside of the United States, like in Japan or mm -hmm. Europe or uh, the Middle East? Let me give you some examples of two different types of examples. One of the questions that we ask is, what best describes you as a, a resident of your city or town, an American citizen, a citizen of the planet Earth? First Globals are the only age cohort that have as many say I'm a citizen of the planet Earth as I am an American citizen. What's really in intriguing to me is that polling in Jordan for example, I've seen the number of young people who say I'm a citizen of the planet Earth go from 3 to 14 to 21 percent. That's a trajectory over the last seven or eight years. Same sort of thing in a, a few other Arab countries. Tunisia is clearly one, uh, Morocco another, um, and, uh, and, and all through Latin America. That's one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is let's look at the BRIC countries. And what you find is a different take. These are, as these countries have emerged, their young people I call local globals in the sense that they feel at one with young people all over the world in a growing sort of way. By the same token, their twist is that they want to um, have uh, restore the imperial greatness of China and of Russia. Young Indians want to assert that India is the largest democracy on the planet. Um, Brazil, Brazil has the Brazilian way that it, it, it talks about. And, uh, you know, in, in many ways, it's a, a they feel there, the, the, there, there is a global destiny for their country. So there is a, a similar sensibility with a localized twist. I'm Dr. Saba. I'm in healthcare, and I'm worried about the children. The children are now being bombarded with technology, and they're going to grow up to be different human beings than what we are. And are we prepared to handle them? Oh, no. <laughs> no what's going to happen? That's the easy one. Um, but look, um, 
Older people have been complaining about younger people from time immemorial. So that, that's one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is, you know, I read this book years ago by Neil Postman, um, Amusing Ourselves to Death, how each new technology um, uh, reduces our skills and our ability to be convivial, to be sociable, and so on. And I have a completely different take on that. I have learned about video games. I've learned about mobile technology. These are the skills that are required. Decisions have to be made quickly. Data, big data, you'll, you're going to have a chance, uh, probably in your lifetime, maybe not in mine, to have it all implanted here. Now comes the very basic question. What the hell do I do with it now that it's up here? And that's the skill set. And so a premium then is placed on the kinds of questions that you ask. This is where the right brain comes in. Who can formulate the questions? A pollster, incidentally, you know, all of us do statistics, but what does any of it mean? The value of a pollster is the right brain, being a historian, being an anthropologist, being somebody who knows people, being somebody who doesn't poll an opinion, but polls values and understands what motivates people. And that is what big data and what these technologies will bring. Now, part of your question also deals with the ability, sociability. What's going to happen to the family as we know it? There will still be mothers and fathers and children, um, but there may not be a dinner table. But we will always find a way to have friends, to be close to family. Skype has brought grandparents and grandchildren together. It's a beautiful thing. It's technology. Um, and that, you know, I mean, that's what will happen. So I'm excited about that. Now, our job and really the, the message here is not only for young people, it's to everybody else. We have to get busy. We have to get busy. We have to enable this group, not only to change the world, but, you know, how do you live in a society where you've got 15, 17, 18 percent of your 20-somethings underemployed? And yet they have wonderful skills. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.